Hey guys, welcome back to the House of the Lizard. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking about a few things. Uh, we're going to be starting to introduce some more pairs, as I said to you. Um, we're fast approaching the breeding season now, and as a result, I'd like to get um, through some of the pairings that we're going to be doing. So we're going to introduce the pied pairings. We've got two pairs this year that we're going to be working with. Then we will introduce one of the orange-headed classics or uh, Spanish uh, pairings. And then in terms of the education side of it, we had an interesting question posed on the Facebook group um, by one of the American uh, subscribers to the channel. Um, and John was asking about uh, what to do with a pair of birds that he thinks were raised by Bengalis. Um, it's some, some imported birds that he got from Spain, as it happens. And yeah, the Spanish birds, a lot of the breeders are using Bengalese. And unfortunately, in this particular case, it looks like it's come from a, uh, a pair that have kind of lost that sort of rearing instinct, if you like, that we were talking about previously. So yeah, he was asking what we should do in that particular case. So I gave him a couple of suggestions and we'll go through uh, what those suggestions are in case you find yourself in a similar predicament. So that's the sort of education side of the channel today. Um, and then just in general, I wanted to chat. So austerity now has come to an end. Um, I ran my austerity from the 25th of November to the 25th of December. Uh, so the birds are on full seed. Now, I have obviously they've continued with their grit all along. And we've also done, um, started putting in some egg food. But one of the mistakes that I see a lot of people making is, is that they stopped the austerity on the 21st. The birds have been eating nothing but one or two types of seed or three types of seed for a month. And uh, now all of a sudden they want to get them into condition as quickly as possible. So suddenly it's grated carrot and broccoli and all sorts of other fresh foods. Um, and now proteins on top of it. And every day they're putting as much nutrition and vitamins and stuff into the birds as physically possible. The problem with that is, is that think for yourself and it reminded me on Christmas Day, funny enough, you know, you typically overindulge, you're eating a lot of rich foods and sweets and all sorts of funny stuff. And what typically happens, you end up with you that you get the runs or diarrhea. And that happened this year, like it does, I suppose, every year, um, where quite a few members of our family found that they had an upset stomach later that night or the following day. And that was kind of the point that I wanted to just bring up before we move on to the specialized sort of sections of the show today. That if you're going to be taking your birds out of austerity and starting to condition them for the breeding season, please be aware that if you go full out straight away, you're likely to end up with diarrhea problems in your bird room. You're going to get an upset stomach on the birds and that kind of thing. And you might even find that you, you haven't lost birds during the molt or during the sort of austerity phase, but now all of a sudden you get a bird that's in a weakened, well not a weakened state, but a low nutrition state from the austerity. And now all of a sudden it gets diarrhea and suddenly you're finding you've got fluffed up birds and you start losing birds. So it's very important to kind of phase it in. Um, so what I typically do, I'll start off with giving them egg food twice a week um, and then I'll slowly bump that up until closer to to sort of the two week mark, three week mark, where I feel that they're used to it now and then I can really start hitting it fairly hard in terms of, of the conditioning food. The sort of fresh vegetables is probably slightly less of an issue than the protein, but I also I, I take it sort of slow in the beginning. Remember, I separate the two. My protein is separate from my fresh uh, veg and, and stuff for conditioning. So what I'll do is I'll give protein, let's say for example, on a Monday, um, Tuesday I'll give them a break from it uh, just to give it, get over any sort of stomach issues. Wednesday I'll then give them the sort of freshly, fresh produce if you like and then give them another day's break and then the second dose of sort of uh, feeding of protein. And so I'll sort of alternate every sort of third day they'll get something. So um, 
that's kind of how I would do it and then sort of slowly ease them back into it. If I do find a bird that's sort of battling a little bit and I feel is, is looking like it's, it's getting a, an upset stomach from all the, and you'll see that in the droppings, I'll be very watery. I would then stop the protein immediately, um, give it a day or two to recover and then slowly introduce it again. So yeah, I think the point is just take it carefully and slowly in the beginning and then slowly you ramp up. Um, some of the birds are quite interesting this year, I found didn't really completely fall out of condition in terms of the hens. I've got a couple that sort of have, have a grey beak and they've supposedly just come out of austerity so they shouldn't really have. Um, but yeah, they're in decent condition and I'll give it another two weeks anyway just for them to get properly into condition and then I'll start introducing nest boxes and things like that. You'll notice with this particular pair while we're on the just sort of general room update, um, the chicks have been removed now, they're all fully through the moles. So that was that uh, the pairing that gave us a white-breasted, normal-looking bird in terms of the greenback, but obviously split for blue because of the dad. Uh, we've got a dilute from them, a uh, purple-breasted dilute, and then, or single factor, um, as we would rather refer to them as. And then we've got a normal-looking hen, um, and then we've got a, a completely normal-looking cock in terms of purple-breasted greenback. Obviously, all four chicks are split for blue because of the dad. Um, so yeah, they will not be breeding obviously this coming season, as I said to you at the beginning of the season, we're not going to breed first years this year, um, however they will be fantastic to have next season, as then it gives me quite a few options in terms of repairing and that kind of thing on the blue project, so we're not repeating um, breedings and that and we can diversify the blood on the blue side as quickly as possible. Um, on that note, unfortunately, we did have a sad loss. Uh, that silver bird that I'd paired up because the hen's beak was so dark. Um, they built a nest, they laid a full clutch of eggs, they laid seven eggs, the hen had just started incubating. Um, I'd come in in the morning, the silver cock was looking fantastic on the perch. In fact, I was considering putting him on the show bench in February if he didn't damage his tail breeding. Um, and he really looked the picture of health. Um, and then came back after doing a bit of business that day. And when I came in to check on the birds at three o'clock in the afternoon, he was basically fitting on the floor. Um, and it looked like he had actually managed to injure himself quite badly, head injury, I mean. Um, I don't know with the load shedding we've been having in South Africa at the moment, we've, it's been quite severe. So we've had like two hours of electricity, then it's awful two hours, sometimes four hours, and it comes back on. I don't know if when it came back on, suddenly uh, with the lights coming on and I went in the room, he got a fright and flew into the bars. Um, I managed to kind of uh, put him in the hospital cage immediately and gave him vitamins and all the rest of it. But unfortunately, he just wasn't able to feed himself and that. So yeah, he passed away about two days later. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's part of the bird keeping game, particularly with finches, they are quite skittish any sort of sudden movement or sudden change like a light suddenly going on unexpectedly can give them a fright and this particular time unfortunately it cost us our silver bird from the blues project then is a split for blue so i'm probably going to look for an alternative pairing for her probably a split bird um, a split for blue bird so it'll be split to split um, but I'm going to give her a couple of weeks now so that she's in sync with all the other birds in the bird room um, and that she can get over that sort of first round that she had laid but unfortunately didn't have an opportunity to sit. With them being the first pairing of the season, I didn't have any alternative birds that I could put the eggs under. And with her having incubated them for one day, obviously the moment they get cold they would have then um, been non, no longer viable. So. Yeah, there just wasn't any other options, unfortunately. So we've lost that, that sort of bloodline completely in terms of that silver bird. Um, but we've still got that white-breasted hen. She is a split for blue, so there is other options for her. Um, and she's only a second year bird. So, you know, we should be able to repair her again this season and also use her again next year for other options. Like, for example, those four offspring from this pairing that we discussed. So yeah, that's kind of what's been happening in the bird room. Um, it's, uh, I need to get on top of the last bit of cleaning before the 
the, the breeding season. So yeah, after I've finished filming this week, I'm going to be scrubbing down the bird room again, uh, making sure everything's spick and span and deep cleaned um, for the breeding season. And then I'll also give the, the Baycox treatment. I've dewormed, I've demited already. So I will do the Baycox. One of the questions we did have uh, subsequent to the last episode was on the Baycox side of things, what's the sort of uh, dosage? So for preventative purposes, the guys typically use uh, a mole to two liters. Um, you can go up higher than that. Um, so if you sort of treating for actual illness, um, three moles to a two liter uh, bottle is fine of water. Um, you're not going to pick up a problem. Baycox is one of those medicines that there's a fair tolerance level. So if you do slightly overdose, obviously you don't want to do that deliberately, but if you do slightly overdose by accident, it's not the end of the world. Um, it's, but yeah, it's a, a very good medicine that. The one that we use for the finches, that was the other question that came up, is the 2.5% soluble. Um, it's the ones that they use for the chickens and that. You do get another version of the product which is not a water soluble one. It's one that they would give orally to the sheep and the cattle and that kind of thing. Um, and that's a 5% dosage. So yeah, just be careful if you are buying it and you, you're asking for that particular one. This is not an endorsement of the product. Don't get me wrong, this isn't any paid promotion. But since we were asked the questions on the channel, um, I just wanted to make sure that the correct information is out there in terms of which one we give and, and what the dosages are. Yeah, enjoy the rest of the show. So first up for the pied project, we have my pied hen from last year. She never bred for us last year with her being a first year, but you can see the green um, sort of across the shoulders, if you like. And then we were donated this cock from Herat. He's an orange head, so normally I don't like to mix the head colors. Um, but in her case, both her parents were orange headed. So she's definitely carrying the orange gene. Um, for him, he's probably not a true pod, um, but you can see there's quite a bit of green feathering in his back. Um, and for that reason, I chose to use him for this particular pairing. Right, so our next pairing is this, uh, for the pied project, is this particular pair. You can see it's a normal cock to a pied hen. The, both these birds were donated by Gerard and they did breed successfully for him last year. They only gave him a single chick that has turned out to be a normal looking dilute, so the hen is definitely carrying the yellow gene, even though she's a majority green bird. And you can see the yellow feathers, um, particularly on this side of her, whereas the other side's quite a bit darker. Um, but she's not a half sider that wouldn't be fertile. Um, so, yeah, she, like I said, has bred before. So I'm quite excited about getting some more chicks from them. Um, if the offspring from her, like I said, is a normal looking dilute, if he is carrying the pied gene, it would mean that it's a recessive pied. Um, but hopefully we'll prove that out with some more chicks this year. She is a bit of an older bird now. Um, this is probably her last breeding season that's viable. Um, in fact, it's already pushing it, and that's why I didn't try and repair her with a different bird. Um, I figured rather leave her with the pairing that Gerard had given her um, as they already bonded and they have bred successfully, so we know that they do raise their chicks. And um, yeah, hopefully they'll breed successfully for us. So yeah, that's basically the pied project. It's the two pairs, the yellow pair, with the green in the feathering and then this green pair with the yellow in the feathering um, and we'll see how things progress the yellow pairing i suspect is a progressive type pod um, because the yellow nape family that it's descended from the yellow nape sometimes only appears in season two or the second molt um, and then gets more as the bird ages um, whereas this particular pied pairing I suspect is a recessive pied, so it's two totally different types, but time will tell. Um, at a later stage, once we know what's going on with each individual um, sort of lineage, if you like, we'll then start pairing the two lineages and see what happens in terms of, you know, if we're mixing recessive to a progressive type. Um, maybe they're both recessive, I don't know, we'll have to see what, what comes out. So it's quite an exciting project in that there's lots of variability um, and there's also lots of sort of different types of genes at play. 
So, yeah, it's going to be, from an academic perspective, it'll be very interesting to see what sort of happens with, with the two pairs and how it progresses over time. One thing I must say, though, with the pod, you can see how the pod affects all the different sort of areas of the bird, um, the mask, the back, and all the rest of it. So it has, and with it being this particular one being quite a dangerous one with it being recessive, I say dangerous because of the fact that it could end up then getting to your sort of lineage and or your bloodline if you like and then every now and then you have parts popping out and it can go the way that the diamond dove went where now you battle to find a normal bird they're all virtually pied birds and for that reason um, I would be very hesitant to sell a pied off to anyone um, from the point of view that it's a particularly dangerous gene in that it could mess up the Gouldian in the long term. Um, I'm a firm believer in the wild type bird and, and the more sort of natural the better. Um, and as a result, we've got to be very careful of any recessive genes um, and particularly the part. So yeah, um, I would breed them from an academic perspective and keep records and all the rest of it but I would be very, very reluctant to actually allow any of them outside of the, the sort of House of Gildian's bird room. Anyway, let's move on to the next part of the show. In terms of the question we had regarding the Spanish pairing that are not raising their chicks, so you guys know from last season I use fostering when it comes to bad parenting um, but Gouldian to Gouldian. So personally I don't use Bengalese or Society Finches um, at all but that is how I typically do it. So my recommendation is that if you have ended up buying a pair that or don't seem to be good parents for whatever reason. Um, in this case, it was some birds that had come from Spain originally, but it could be from anywhere in the world as, as guys. You do use Bengalese um, for Gouldians a fair bit. What I would recommend is, you've got two options in my mind. The one would be to put those birds into a flight scenario or aviary scenario and let them communal breed. Um, it's not that they raise each other's chicks, but what will happen is is that Gouldians are incredibly nosy birds when it comes to other nests. So they will often peer in the hole of another nest of parents that are busy raising chicks. And as a result, that pair would then be able to see what they should be doing. They would see other parents feeding the little chicks. Um, they would see them feeding the birds when they come out of the nest and are, are fledged and on the perch. And as a result, hopefully that kind of awakens that instinct, if you like, on what they should be doing. So in other words, it will be a learnt behaviour. In psychology, you get two types of behaviour. You get inherent behaviour, which is basically your sort of genetically inherited behaviour. And they've proven that there is some of that behaviour that comes through using things like twin studies and all that kind of thing. And I do have my undergrad degree in psychology, so I'm not making this up. Um, you do get a certain amount of behavior that comes through your sort of genetics, if you like. And then the other side of behavior is very much your um, learned behavior. And that's what I'm referring to in this case. So one way to rectify the bad parenting problem, obviously, if it hasn't inherited those sort of instincts, if you like, um, it would be difficult to get that back. But you can certainly, um, you know, try and teach them through them observing other birds. The next option, and that's why I was mentioning the fostering side of things, is that would be to take the bad parents' eggs and swap them with one of your sort of good parents' pairs, if you like, in your bird room. Or, um, and as a result, the chicks will then be raised by the decent parents. So A, you've got the genetics and you've secured that, that you haven't invested in these birds and now you don't get any successful breeding out of them. But what it also does is I would then leave those first round chicks with the parents. And that's something that we discussed with both Ahmed and um, I think I mentioned it with Javier as well when we were chatting. And that I leave, if possible, those first clutch of, of youngsters with the parents when they have their second clutch. So what will happen? You've got the genetics from 
in this case the Spanish birds, and you've now given it, they've been raised, those eggs were hatched and raised by one of the, the other pairs, and then they now left with the parents and they seen their parents hatch out um, these sort of step siblings if you like if you if you don't swap the eggs a second time and they've also observed their parents feeding them and looking after them and all that kind of thing you remove the siblings once they've observed the second clutch being raised and the benefit of that would be then once again that learned behavior um, and then hopefully they would improve and start raising their own chicks to get the sort of um, instinctual behavior back the inherent behavior in other words you would have to do selective breeding over a series of, of or a period of, of a series of generations so yeah you would have to take the birds that did show some sign of trying to raise the young um, versus the ones that didn't and then sort of use that learned behavior to try and improve on that select then the best pairings the following year that looked after their chicks or attempted to and keep those and then eliminate the pairs that were bad parents and then slowly re sort of develop that instinct if you like of good parenting remember what javier was saying it's not that one season of bad breeding will give you bad parents it's that you lose it over time perhaps but more importantly you losing the, the natural you always get like human beings you'll get some people that make fantastic parents others that maybe are less great parents it's the same with the birds so you know by using bengalese we've perhaps um, lost touch with which are our better parenting birds and which aren't and you've lost that natural selection remember bad parenting birds their chicks wouldn't survive and therefore it wouldn't proliferate um, in the wild whereas a decent parent of birds their genes are going to get passed on why because they're raising their chicks so you've lost that natural elimination um, and if you're fostering the birds you're not um, having the benefit of that natural selection process so you need to effectively reintroduce it with the birds that you now used a little bit of behavioral learning and perhaps fostering under decent parents and then you know slowly over time select the better parents and that kind of thing so yeah that's kind of the education segment i thought it was a very interesting sort of question that was raised and um, i thought it would be great just to chat about that as i'm sure he's not the only person that's running into that kind of problem um, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you enjoyed the section on the, the parents, uh, at least on the pie project and our pairings and that kind of thing. And we'll see you again in two weeks time.